From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Noel is on adventures today. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Matt, my, my dear, dear friends. Yes. I think at this stage we can call each other old friends. I was surprised that I didn't know the answer to this question on your side. I was I was thinking about this off air. Have you ever been to a protest? Two things. Mm. We've known each other for over 12 years now, uh, so we're definitely old friends. And yes, I have attended a few protests in my day, uh, specifically here in Atlanta when the Occupy movement was gaining steam. Mm. They, they had one at a park downtown that that I think, did we both go to that one? By GSU? Wait, yeah, we yeah. did. Well, did we go at the same time? I think we went separately. Okay, yeah, because it was ongoing. It was for multiple days. I met up with some more radical people that I knew uh, just to see what was going on. And it was uh, it was an experience. It was the first time I ever saw the the megaphone speak that was popular right. in that, where, where people like pick up basically announce that they're going to speak Mm -hmm. and then they speak and then everybody kind of repeats what they're saying so everyone in the larger audience can hear. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. Yeah, it's something that that I think a lot of mainstream America learned about with the Occupy movement, but there is an entire subculture of resources and techniques, tools, and tips used by the counterculture or used by people protesting governments. Megaphone uh, communication is one instance of that, but you can find some great guides online still. I don't know how long they will be up that will tell you about the, you know, the best way to avoid brutality by law enforcement or to survive, you know, tear gassing or other yeah. crowd dispersal. Even technologies. Uh, yeah, even tips on what to wear, what your decor should be. Like, be stylish and avoid tear gas. <laughs> right, right, right. Very much so. And recently, you and I, who have always been fascinated by counterculture and those things that exist on the edges of American mainstream culture, the things that you will never hear about on the evening news, um, you and I recently went to one of your favorite bookstores and in the basement, in a corner, in the basement of this bookstore, we stumbled onto a counterculture node, uh, free zines, um, books of – works of philosophy, right? Yeah, stuff stuff that I think I mentioned while we were down there like – I can un- I can understand why it's down here in this corner or underneath the staircase essentially yeah. <laughs> and not just fully on display for everyone that walks in. Literally and figuratively underground. Yeah. Which and was it was cool. cool. Mm-hmm. But also it felt a little dangerous. Uh, <laughs> but really just good to know that that type of free press can exist still even if it's – Slightly covered in darkness. Even if it puts you on a list. But we were on a list a long time ago. That ship has sailed. Yeah. So I've been to protest as well. Uh, I've been to all sorts of protests because it's a fascinating social phenomenon. That's that's how I look at it. Even protests that I didn't believe in, you know, like I I didn't agree with the cause of a protest, but I was already on the train. (laughs) So I said, I'll swing by. And and most of the protests that I have attended have been in Atlanta. I've been there as an observer, occasionally a participant. Uh, But I've also been involved in protest in Central America. And that's that's something that's a little bit sticky if you're not native to a land because one of the first things that the State Department will tell you to do and a lot of government agencies will tell you to do this is to avoid any public demonstrations if you are in a foreign country. Really? And is that because of surveillance of some kind or when you're dealing with a 
a visa or a, a passport or a, a reason that you're in the country that's not a standard citizen? You don't want to ever get put on a list, basically? It's – yeah, it's – First and foremost, an issue of personal safety. Um, okay. Imagine, for instance, that you are in a part of the world that maybe doesn't have the best rule of law. People are panicked. People are unhappy. There's a powder keg situation and you appearing very different, maybe speaking a different language, moving differently. Despite your best intentions, you may become the fuse for that powder keg. Interesting. There have been plenty of, you know, I study, I study mass hysteria because uh, I have a heck of a social life. And uh, one of the things that happens, this happened in Central America as well. I was not involved. Uh, there were people who had been murdered during protest because members of the public believed that their children were being stolen by wealthy foreigners. Uh, and that their organs were being harvested. And so in one case, a Japanese man and his driver, Japanese national and his driver, were pulled out of their car and murdered because clearly if they're not from this country, they must be smuggling organs. The point is the protest can quickly, quickly turn into something that is not peaceful. You know, a, they can turn into a riot very, very easily. Yeah, just from having that number of people in one space, mm -hmm. no matter how open or large it is, that, that mob mentality, right? Exactly. In earlier episodes, you and I explored how various world governments, including, of course, Uncle Sam, have a history of secretly monitoring groups that may, you know, organize a demonstration or a protest, and they monitor these groups if they consider them to be a threat to domestic security or the status quo. And one of the questions about the, that concerns this idea of infiltration and monitoring is immediate. Just how far can this monitoring go? To explore that first, we have to define what a protest actually is. And there's an important distinction here. Yeah. Uh, generally, when you think about protests, you're thinking about dissent of some widely held opinion or uh, maybe a law or something that is considered status quo, right? It, and it's a declaration of your opinion, a single person's opinion, I disagree or I dissent, right? But uh, it's important to note the protest, while it is, you know, an individual um, – Action, essentially, a protest is an individual action. When you have enough people and come together, generally, you're here, you're going to be thinking about protest as a group activity. Right, uh, right. Or a thing, like a, a gathering as a protest. But really, it's just a bunch of people getting together mm. and uh, voicing their, their uh, singular belief. Right, right, or their cluster of related beliefs. Yes, which is what we saw with the Occupy movement. Right, right, and that's something that mainstream news uh, – delighted in. It's yeah. What is this about? It's not really about anything. Nobody's right? saying the same thing. Everybody's angry. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying the same thing. Harumph, harumph, harumph. <laughs> Something must be done, right? Sometimes you can just feel it. So, so that, that is an important distinction. If you're, if you're speaking uh, with a technical definition, a by-the-book definition, a protest is something you do as an individual, but that word is evolving in these our modern days because you're never going to hear about a protest in a non-fictional world unless it's describing what you said, Matt, a group of people. And here in the U.S., which is by no means a perfect country, protests are still legal since the adoption of the First Amendment in December of 1791. People in this country have the right to assemble in a peaceful manner to make our various opinions on one issue or another known to the public, to anyone who walks by, to anyone who happens to cover it in the media. And important to note, these opinions do not have to be well-informed. No. <laughs> there are a lot of protests that are, you know, perhaps more emotionally driven than factually driven. And the tricky thing about this is that people often don't agree on an issue. And that's why a lot of times at a protest, uh, I think a good example would probably be uh, some of the – I don't even know how to describe it. Some of the far-right groups that will have a protest and then 
another group of people will have a counter protest immediately adjacent to where the first group is having a protest. Yes. And that, and they're within their rights to do that if they uh, apply for the permits and all the things you have to do nowadays. But that that's where you get real problems. <laughs> right. That's the that's the powder keg thing. That's why, for example, you'll see um, like a, a very controversial issue in the U.S. for a long time uh, concerned women's rights yes. and abortion. And you would see people who were anti-women's rights or um, pr- pro-life, they would call it, or people who were pro-abortion or pro-choice at the same events. They would yell chants. All of this is perfectly legal. As, but as long as they don't physically <laughs> hit each other yeah. or try to get other people to attack people that they disagree with, this this is just street rules, baby. Speaking of powder keg moments, because then you you know if you add law enforcement and en mass to this as an equation, that's where big problems can can arise. And I mean, this whole thing can be very very controversial because who. Who are they protecting? They're essentially protecting everyone, right? In a protest like this, mm-hmm. that's what it's supposed to be, right? But how do you? Yeah, but the <laughs> the logistics of doing that in a way that is nonviolent. Ugh, I'm right. glad I don't have that job. And it's still it's still a job that's going to be around until the laws change, because freedom of assembly and freedom of speech are on paper guaranteed. They're also closely related, but the thing is that since their creation, these rights have been more or less under some level of continual threat. It turns out, folks, and I don't think this is a surprise for any of us listening today, that the people in power are very much pro-protest. They're very in favor of this right to assembly and freedom of speech when they agree with the opinion or platform being presented. So if you are If you are the governor of a place or you're the mayor of a town and people are protesting uh, something a little bit smaller in scale, like the construction of a Walmart, and you you also, as the mayor, have made your election bread and butter off of supporting local businesses, then you'll say, yeah, the people have a right to assemble. They can say what they want. I have no official statement on this, uh, but I do hope everyone turns out to vote. Yeah, or or I'm you can you know they can sit in their office and be be glad that these people are getting the steam like off of their or they're getting these feelings off their chest in public. They're feeling like they're doing something when in reality you've already signed all the checks. Right, right. Because when these same people in power disagree with a particular opinion, uh, say there's a group of folks protesting what they see as an unfair tax scheme, right? Mm. For instance, uh, the Tea Party uh, yeah. of a few years back was, was huge. Was very active in that regard. Uh, or let's say there's the opening of an unpopular building, the Walmart example, or a piece of infrastructure. People really don't want the interstate or the train coming through town or don't build a prison in our neighborhood, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Or a pipeline, maybe. Or a pipeline, excellent example. Then people in power have several different tools they can use to change the narrative and frame this less as a uh, protest, less as an exercise in civil rights, and start um, start presenting it as something that is violent, you know, that is yeah. threatening, that is going to um, endanger families, across the area and the ACLU has uh, has a statement that that summarizes some of the the tools that those in power can use to neuter discredit or uh, cast aspersion on demonstrations yeah and we'll read that and it's got uh, one of one of my favorite quotations slash made up words uh, phrases that's ever existed in the history of uh, since I've been alive, this phrase yeah. Yeah, that's going to be in here. In recent history, challenges to the right to protest have come in many forms. In some cases, police crack down on demonstrations through mass arrests, illegal use of force or curfews. Elsewhere, law enforcement limits expression by corralling protesters in so-called free speech zones. 
And we've heard of these, and <laughs> you may have seen these. They've been made fun of on places like Arrested – or in shows like Arrested Development mm-hmm. and other places uh, where it's just a cage essentially where, okay, everyone get in this cage. This is the free speech zone. It's so Orwellian. <laughs> It's so messed up. Uh, And the official reason for free speech zones, by the way, uh, being that they can guarantee the safety of the protesters. Yeah. Because they're in the cage. (laughs) It's so messed up. I'm just saying that's Uh, that's the – that is the official guideline. But currently, love them or hate them, protests are as American as apple pie and they seem hopefully here to stay. In fact, uh, despite – Various quite valid concerns about uh, huge corporations taking power from the government or the government going increasingly big brother yeah. on people who live here. Uh, the The fact of the matter is that protests are escalating not just in frequency but also in size. Each of the top 10 attended protests in American history occurred – since 1963, and furthermore, each of the top four occurred since the beginning of the current presidential administration, the Trump admin. That it's it's that's astounding. And let's go to should we go to the number one? Yeah, let's just go ahead and just hit the number one, just because everyone's wondering what it is. It was the 2017 Women's March, and a lot of our coworkers who mm-hmm. who are here at now iHeartMedia, how stuff works, stuff media, whatever it was called. Um, a lot of our coworkers were there. My wife was there, uh, my sister, a lot of her friends. Uh, it was January 21st, 2017. And there were an estimated somewhere between 3.3 and 4.6 million people assembled across the United States. Mm-hmm. Huge. It was a huge amount of people and they had managed to unite for a cause. A lot of our coworkers who did go up there were there partially as participants but mainly as – documentarians. Yeah. They were interviewing people. They were filming stuff. Yeah, know? absolutely. And the number two spot, mm-hmm. next year's Women's March 2018. <laughs> right, right. So we know that protests are growing in frequency. We know that they're growing in size. The question is how long can this situation last? It's no secret that other countries have effectively removed the right to assemble, at least for certain groups. Um, there, there are numerous examples, but I, I want us to focus on some of the examples that may be surprising. When we think of protest or right to assembly being quashed, we think of authoritarian regimes, right? We think of uh, the DPRK probably wouldn't take kindly to protest or maybe uh, certain countries – Maybe, maybe like Sudan wouldn't take kindly yeah. to a protest, right? Or yeah, anyone that has a very rigid structure within the government and how it functions. I, and I think I think about China just because of the sure. People's Republic, and uh, and it, it's weird I, focusing on on nations in Asia. But uh, in- interesting. By the way, Matt, we called it on the social credit thing. Did you oh, see dude, people I are saw. getting turned down for plane flights? Everyone called us crazy or <laughs> we were being alarmist. But I thought I thought we did a fairly even-handed look at uh, – Sesame credit. Yeah. And very soon um, – it's working. So very soon it will be everywhere. We will all be in that Black Mirror episode. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. But uh, if you want to learn what – Sesame credit or social credit is, uh, check out our earlier episode, which could do with an update but still needs help. We did it before it was implemented as an optional thing when it was just a a twinkle in an authoritarian's eye and now it is happening and people are being severely punished for disagreeing with the party line. With whom do you associate, Ben? (laughs) Negative 700 points. (laughs) Yeah, just on your friendship levels. Anyway, uh, so – we wanted to look at countries that didn't fit that bill, that didn't seem like authoritarian regimes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't seem like East German Soviet bloc type things. Spain has something called the citizen security law. The citizen security law gives police the discretionary ability to hand out fines of up to 
$650,000 U.S. equivalent to unauthorized demonstrators if they protest near a transport hub or a nuclear power plant. So if you're by a train station or a bus station. Or a nuclear power plant. Or a nuclear power plant. (laughs) And police can also issue fines of up to $30,000 U.S. for taking photographs of police during a protest, failing to show police ID upon request, or gathering in an unauthorized way near government buildings. Which, can you imagine how that, how that would go down in the, in the United States? I mean, at Pennsylvania Avenue, no matter what day you go, no matter what the weather's like, there's always a ton of people outside. Like across the street from the White House? Uh-huh. Yeah, a ton of people. Um, but again, I, I'd love to see what, like how that breaks down of – unauthorized ways of gathering is it is right. it formations is it levels like they don't like levels like from theater so right right know, right, right. somebody got that was that. great yeah <laughs> okay they're not doing uh they're not doing body pyramids yeah yeah all right but but in all seriousness let's let's look at another country that you wouldn't expect canada Right. Quebec specifically, at the height of a wave of student strikes in 2012, uh, the Quebec legislature passed a thing called Bill 78. This made pickets and unauthorized gatherings of over 50 people illegal. It also punished people with fines. So if you were in violation of Bill 78, as an individual, you would have to pay up to five, five grand. And if you were an organization, you have to pay 125 grand. Yikes. And that's it's written in such a way that uh, the organization can get hit with that 125k fine, and then all the individuals can additionally get hit with that 5k fine. And we know it's possible for protests to be legally blocked, and we have hard historical evidence of operations like COINTELPRO. And this things like this prove that domestic monitoring of dissident groups has, at the very least, occurred. In the past, let's pause for a word from our sponsor and continue unraveling this ball of increasingly terrifying string. Cuddle cat, cuddle fish, the second oil age. And his kingdom was full of darkness. I don't dispute the Eros data, but if he's down here, we'd know. Not blood, but darkness. The Earth's black riches. No. I could taste it on my lips. Today, I want to talk to you about the science of transgenesis. Transgenesis.show. So in the in the pizza that we're constructing here, sorry, I didn't eat lunch, so you thinking these, about pizza? These are gonna be all food metaphors. Right. Okay. <laughs> I hope that's all right with us listening, <laughs> with everyone listening. So in the pizza that we're building of explaining protest and the people trying to stop or control them. I'm with you. Okay, we've got we got the people, the the dough and the sauce, and then let's look at the counter protesting things as as the toppings or the people trying to stop the pizza from being made. There's a very very crucial ingredient that we're missing here, and that is corporations. Private entities are not above suppressing news of a protest. So maybe maybe let's say you're a big company like – okay, you're Nestle, whatever. All right. Yeah, you're Nestle. Let's say you're Nestle and people are protesting your wildly profitable practice of exploiting water use rights – to take water from one place and sell it as bottled water. And you don't, for some reason, have the ability to make the local government change the law so that people can no longer protest. But what you can do is influence media coverage of this so that the protest, while it may actually happen, doesn't get covered on your local, you know, CBS or Fox 5 or whatever. uh, And it doesn't maybe get on national coverage, even if people are getting shot, violence breaks out. Maybe CNN just shows a video of a, of a cute dog that learned to ride a bicycle on its own. They do that all the time. Yeah, I think it was a tricycle. The question there— I would do if I was CNN. 
I wouldn't want to look at all that other stuff. Just uh, show the dog. Show the dog. Show the dog. No one mentioned Syria. If no one saw it, the reasoning goes, did it happen? And this is – this is this is a powerful question and I know that we all tend to as human beings think of ourselves as critical analysts of the world in which we live but we are very easily fooled. The, the, more, the more I learn about human psychology, we've been through a lot, Matt. The more I learn about human psychology, like the, the increasingly – Depressed, yeah. We become, yeah, know? we we fool each other and ourselves a lot. Mm-hmm. And speaking of fooling, we've got. I, I know we meandered a little bit. I'm sorry for the tangents. I'm a little punchy. Speaking of fooling people, we're getting to one of the most important, powerful, and obscure tools used by the anti-protest crowd. It is something that does not get a ton of airtime and never will, by the way, and it's something that you won't hear governments or law enforcement outfits and certainly not corporations mention in public unless they are denying its existence. What do the powerful do when legal means of stifling dissent don't cut the mustard? How far would they go to discredit a movement, an organization, or a cause. Enter the agent provocateur. Here's where it gets crazy. Let's just call this section, we've never seen this guy before. I think that encapsulates it perfectly. (laughs) So agent provocateurs, who are they, Matt? Aside from a really cool French name, what are they? They're uh, an agent provocateur is a catalyst that exists within a group of people, a lot of times a somewhat like-minded group of people who are – they're going to, again, like a, like a catalyst, entice somebody else, maybe a group of people to do something that they probably wouldn't do, like an illegal act, let's say, some kind of uh, rash decision – uh, something that will falsely implicate the people around the a- agent provocateur of partaking in whatever illegal act this agent provocateur has done. Mm-hmm. Let's say something like smashing a window, um, uh, jump, setting fire to a police vehicle, something like that. It's something to ruin the reputation of all those surrounding the agent. Right, right. So the agent provocateur may commit a crime. Yeah hoping to be, as you said, a catalyst, may attempt to entice other people, civilians, to commit a a crime or may falsely implicate them in something. If you want – this is just a – Just by proximity. Right, right. Say there, there's a protest, uh, some provocateurs turn it into a riot and the police swoop in. And while the police are swooping in, one of these people, sunglasses, bandana, the whole nine, they bust open uh, the front display of a pizzeria. And <laughs> as the, I told, I'm not lying. This is going to keep happening okay, all right, all right. Unless, <laughs> unless you <laughs> shut down my right to free pizza speech. I'm going to get you some Cheez-Its. I, you know what? I am so on board. But let's. But seriously, this is an okay example. Uh, they break into this thing, and a civilian protester nearby is is standing there wondering what the heck's going on. But as the uh, uniformed police are running by, the person who has broken into the pizzeria like throws pizza at this innocent person. Yeah. So it, so they are falsely implicated in this crime, and sure. That may not result in a conviction, but it will probably result in them at least being taken in for anywhere from a few hours to a few days. Yeah, and and in a very similar type of example, if that person, that agent provocateur breaks into the front of the pizza joint, Mm -hmm. a group of 10 to 100 people that are somewhat close to him while he's doing that – feel that intensity in the moment, Mm -hmm. are angry about whatever it is they're protesting about, and then they join in and start – you know, making their own Supremes like while, while they're there. <laughs> and it's because of that mentality uh, and that amped up adrenaline that occurs in those situations that it only takes one person to take that one further step that perhaps everyone else will do it. Which is a shame, you know, man, because you should just support your local pizza joint. <laughs> right. I feel like I'm losing the thread of this, but, <laughs> but it's true. You know, it's true. People are, especially in large gatherings or in mobs, in a place where there's not a an asserted number of social mores, 
right? Like uh, when, when people are in those uncertain situations, they will follow the lead. Yeah. I say they, we will follow we. the lead because we're no better, right? And it doesn't happen every time. But it does happen. But it does happen. The history of secret police planting agent provocateurs in popular movements, it's an ancient practice. But it goes back – like the modern version of it goes back at least to 19th century France and 20th century Russia. So in 1905, the priest who led the St. Petersburg Revolution, we know was some sort of double agent and the man who organized the assassination – of the czar's uncle, the Grand Duke, was also a double agent. We have a documented case of this in the U.S. We have several, but here's one. Yeah, one is of Tommy the Traveler. Uh, This guy was a member of the Students for a Democratic Society. You may have heard heard of them as the SDS. Uh, He's an organizer who, after years of trying to arise some kind of violent action, he he convinced these two other people, two 19-year-old students, to actually firebomb an ROTC headquarters at this uh, college, Hobart College in upstate New York. Um, and ROTC is the, the – it's training. It's training for like future military essentially. Right, right, right. The Reserve Officers Training Corps. Yes, A lot exactly. of high school members, a lot of college members. You've, and you've probably heard SDS and ROTC together when, when learning about the, um, the violent – or not the violent, but the protests that ended up turning violent um, in the 1960s. Yes. A lot of those. The SDS was a big group there. Mm-hmm. And in our previous episodes on the FBI and their handling of informants, we look into some of some of those actions as well as COINTELPRO. We've got some listeners in the audience who lived through the 60s and – can tell you, especially a lot of us younger folks, can tell you that this was an alarmingly fragile time for the U.S. It was one of the first times that people who were civilians could get unedited, unpropagandized uh, footage of American actions in Vietnam and learned that war was not as noble, perhaps, as they have been led to believe. But this still this still continues. Agent provocateurs are essentially double agents. And how do they work? Let's uh, let's take a hypothetical example and let's see, Paul, how long you let us get away with this. Okay. All right. So, Matt, picture our good, good friend, Paul Mission Control Deccan. Okay. I'm focusing on his mustache. Got it. All right. He's got a mustache now. He's active in the um, anti-widget community. He and his fellow activists, you see, hate the way that widgets are destroying the environment, endangering children, pushing out local businesses, or what have you. Widgets are bad. They agree. So Paul and his friends get together to publicly protest widgets on the steps of the state capitol. Which state are we in? We are – ooh, pick a good one. Mm, Illinois. Okay, we're in Illinois. So Paul and his friends – have done this before. They've protested here at the Capitol um, multiple times. They're very anti-widget. So they know all the legal ins and outs. They have their permits secured. They have, um, you know, they've reached out to local news organizations and so on. And they're able to avoid law enforcement shutting down the protests. However, the governor of Illinois in this, again, hypothetical example – has relied heavily upon Big Widget for funding in her or his last campaign. So it's in their best interest to make sure that this protest, if it does have to happen, somehow discredits the anti-Widget movement. So fast forward to the day of the protest. All right, so we got a ton of anti-Widgeters assembled in Springfield, Illinois, down there by the Capitol. There are just signs everywhere with all these really clever and, you know, somewhat um, snarky, a little bit snarky, Signs that are anti-widgets. They got slogans on them. They got memes. People brought their families. They're banging pots. Uh, Representatives from other activist groups joined up as well, like kind of closely related groups but not in the same exact thing. You got the uh, food not bombs thing. They're they're hanging out. A couple other environmental groups, some prison activists, a couple of vegans showed up. Um, Some Antifa, some some, like train kids. yeah. Who Definitely trained kids. off the rails and are, you know, protesting in favor of general anarchy anyway. Yes. So at this point, 
you know, Paul, uh, the guy over here, and his mustache, they're like hanging out. They're loving this. All his friends are there. They're so ecstatic because so many people have joined up for the cause. Mm -hmm. So many folks are there. Power to the people, right? right? Of course, a lot of these people are strangers. A lot of strangers. Mm -hmm. Completely new to Paul and his friends. And, you know, again, Paul and his friends are happy because it means their campaign is spreading across all these different groups, across all these different people. The social media campaign that they were using, it really paid off. Some of these protesters, however, look like a tad uh, disconcerting. They don't quite blend in with the rest of the crowd. They seem, in fact, unusually aggressive. Huh. Despite the fact that everyone who has been at previous anti-widget meetings knows that the police are just there to maintain peace, right? Yeah. To make sure there's not any violence and that you are not supposed to antagonize the police. They're the, probably friends of local law enforcement right. there amongst the anti-widgeters. Yeah, right. They're not protesting the police. They're protesting these uh, insidious widgets, yeah. right? And these people who have appeared – are wearing outfits that are typically attributed to something called the Black Bloc, a spectrum of violent protest tactics. But the problem is that unlike legit Black Bloc members or Black Bloc practitioners, these guys have clothes that look like they're right off the rack of a store. They're yeah. brand new and their boots seem to match the boots that, <laughs> that the police are wearing. Very similar. So they appear to be incredibly aggressive. They're taunting the cops who are there to monitor the protests. They're trying to turn the crowd against the cops despite all the work that Paul and the Anti-Widget Collective have put in to making this a, a peaceful demonstration. It turns out in this example that widgets are a very emotionally charged issue here in Springfield, Illinois. The crowd is already angry. There's the – Slight tangy scent of blood in the air, right? A lot of people have lost their livelihood due to widgets. And let's let's up the stakes and say that some people have died in some way related to widgets. The group has scheduled a short list of speakers. And it is Paul Mission Control Deccan's turn to grab the microphone. So he steps up on a makeshift podium. He greets the crowd to enthusiastic cheers. And he begins to outline the evils of widgets. And more importantly, the solutions that he and his crew propose. And someone yells, burn it down. And someone else yells, yeah, burn it down. Hold on, says Paul, but it's too late. People begin chanting, burn it down. 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 Hold on, says Paul, but it's too late, guys. It's way too late because the chant is now, it's too much. It overcomes everything else. Pause. Zoom in. There's a person in the crowd you could miss. It's a guy with a baseball cap, a black hoodie, brand new, black jeans, brand new, black boots, brand new, gloves on his hands. Let's zoom in. Enhance, computer. Okay. He has donned a bandana over the lower half of his face. He's sneaking in and around through the crowd. He doesn't particularly seem to be shouting anymore. Everybody else is doing that for him. Now let's press play again and watch as he picks up and throws a brick through a nearby car window. Other people start attacking this car. Because, yeah, you hear the smash. You're, everyone's in this fever pitch. And now a moment of violence occurs and everyone starts to join in. The police... They see this happening, and this is dangerous. They have to protect everyone who's in this protest, including the people surrounding the violence, so they just swoop in. But now that the crowd, at least por portions of the crowd, mm -hmm. are becoming violent, so they attack the police in return. And if the police respond to these attacks, then the crowd easily interprets it as the police just attacking people and they panic. Pandemonium occurs. Some people, everybody runs. Some people run away from the violence. Some people run toward it in hopes of, you know, likely in hopes of rescuing their fellow protesters from the anti-widget collective. Paul Mission Control Decant stands there for a moment on this makeshift platform, baffled. 
How did this all go so wrong, so completely, and so quickly? Gunshots explode through the afternoon air, cutting his moment of reverie short. He ducks to the ground, and he wonders what will be on the news. Oh, man. Mission Control. I feel like we got to help him. Let's, well, you know what we should do? Let's, uh, let's get some sponsors in here. And we are back. Again, this is only a hypothetical example. Uh, our good friend, super producer Paul, is hale and hearty and is not, uh, has not at this point become the victim of a violent protest. But that does not make this story an implausible one. The practice of sabotaging protests in this manner is ancient and it's varied and it goes across political spectrums, it goes across ideologies, and it goes across industry, religion, and state. Labor spies infiltrated, disrupted, and subverted union activities all the live long day and they used agent provocateurs at protest. Unfortunately, it doesn't get reported in a lot of, uh, in a lot of history classes, but – we still have unions today. So, Matt, yeah. what's an example of a union where this could happen? Uh, I don't know a lot of them. I have some friends who are Teamsters, which is kind of cool. If you think about Hollywood and now mm. in Atlanta is the film industry is going around. And I believe Gimlet Media, the staff there, is attempting to unionize or they're planning on us- unionizing. Um, has something to do with Spotify. But anyway, who knows? Podcast unions may be a thing of the future. All right. There we go. (laughs) It's a podcast union protest and the the cops want to come down hard. (laughs) Sorry, probably don't. (laughs) For some reason. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, so all they have to do is have a large enough group of people and then have someone just push the needle, just nudge things in a less stable direction, just be an agent of chaos. The activities of agent provocateurs against revolutionaries in imperial Russia were notorious and infamous. In the U.S., as we know, the activities of COINTELPRO included uh, tasking FBI agents to pose as political activists and participate in meetings with groups like the Ku Klux Klan, the American Indian Movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I, we're including these three examples just to show that the, it ran the gamut. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, and then especially went to uh, Black Panthers right. movement, mm-hmm. a lot of um, black nationalist movements, and, and community based organizations like that, like vegans. Yeah, Ve- that's why we were jokingly talking about <laughs> vegans being there because they did infiltrate vegan groups. They Super do monitor, yeah. <laughs> And even um, more, maybe more fringe animal rights groups yeah. also get also get the uh, unblinking eye. There's uh, another example. We we mentioned Canada in in Quebec uh, in 2007. Protesters accused police of using undercover agents to provoke violent confrontations at the North American Leaders Summit in Montebello, Quebec. These accusations have been made before, but this time. These agent provocateurs were caught on camera. Oh, yeah. There was a video that you can see of these uh, demonstrations on YouTube. I remember watching it back in the day, and you may still be able to find it. It may not be the original videos, but it's at least uh, existing there as proxies um, or just duplicates. Their uh, their faces, these young guys, the three dudes, they're, they've got bandanas on their faces. They're mingling with protesters in front of a line of police in riot gear. And at least one of these guys is holding a rock in his hand, okay? Then one of the, organiz- uh, one of the organizers of the actual protesters, a guy named Dave Coles, he's the president of Communications, uh, Energy, and Paper Workers Union of Canada, uh, this guy makes it clear to the masked men. He's like talking to them. He's saying, guys, it looks like you're – I mean this isn't verbatim, but he's saying it looks like you're trying to be violent and we know you're not a part of our group. What are you doing here? He also – Dave Coles is my favorite line in this story. Dave Coles describes the group of actual protesters yes. as mainly grandparents. Well, yeah. If you watch the video, I, I don't, you don't want to judge anybody, but the ages of the people actually there protesting in their insular group are older, significantly older than these other guys. You're right. There's this big age difference, and he urges these three masked men to leave and go 
this is our protest turf. Yeah. Go go protest somewhere else with your aggro ways and your weird disguises. And it gets even weirder from there. So Coles then demands that these guys put down their rocks and stop being so, you know, at least looking like they're going to be violent. Other protesters like start chiming in and they're saying, wait a second, these guys, these guys are police officers. These are agents. These are, and they actually call them agent provocateur, I believe in the video. Mm -hmm. Um, Several of the people try to actually take the bandanas off their faces so they can get video evidence of their faces. And rather than leave these three men, rather than leave when confronted with a group who are starting to, you know, get upset at them, uh, they actually start getting closer to the police, like backing away into the police line, essentially, for protection, perhaps, um, mm-hmm. from from a bunch of grandparents. Um, just leave that there. Um, and then they seem to start discussing or, or talking with the police and the police talking to them as a discussion. Then eventually they push their way past an officer and um, other police then push them down on the ground and they handcuff these guys mm-hmm. to take them away, essentially. Yep. But – the thought here is that they actually got loaded up into a car and they're like, oh, man, that didn't work out. All right, guys, let's uh, regroup back at the HQ. <laughs> and initially, the police department denied any knowledge of this or involvement. However, it was hard to argue against video and they did they – did, uh, they did admit that – those three folks were undercover. However, they said they were not there to incite violence. They were there to make sure that things did not get violent. Although, man, that video. And they were the ones holding the rocks. Yep. So we know that the practice of using agent provocateurs to infiltrate protest and the practice of using government money, your your tax dollars, yeah. by the way, if you if you live in one of the countries we're talking about, we know this practice has been escalating in step with the growth of protest. And it makes sense. In the United Kingdom alone, for example, undercover police officers have spied on more than 1,000 political groups since 1968, but there's no official list of these groups. There's nothing that's been published. This is pieced together from leaked information that comes out years or decades later. Additionally, Corporate interests, never one to uh, never one to miss a, a, a space in the market, have continued to increase their involvement in protest infiltration. And we found some some pretty fascinating documents that were leaked to the Guardian and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. So we got a couple of companies here: British Airways, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and Porsche. And uh, there are a whole bunch of other ones on the on a list that we found. But they have paid por- uh, corporate intelligence firms to monitor political groups that challenged their businesses. So they're looking at groups that uh, may cause a PR problem or worse for them. Right, right. And one of these corporate intelligence firms is an outfit named C2I International, although they, I believe they changed their name afterwards. They were caught using two professional infiltrators to get advance warning of demonstrations against these firms. You mentioned, Matt, British Airways, Royal Bank, Porsche, all mm-hmm. the hits, all the hits. Uh, and then notify those firms before the demonstrations occur, the idea being that they could preemptively shut them down if possible. Or they could just infiltrate it. Or they could just infiltrate. I'm sure there's something like a menu, right? The infiltrators would pretend to be activists sympathetic to the cause of the campaigners and they would get in – during the lead up to the demonstration, they would be showing up at the meetings. They would help organize. They would attend the demonstrations. And we're making this sound serious and dystopian and a little bit shadow runny, but sometimes this included silly protests too. One of the infiltrators had to dress up as a pirate with a with a cutlass and an eye patch as part of the protest. They had to wear costumes. I bet they were they were against Porsche, right? <laughs> for some reason or another. Just for the alliteration? Yeah. Uh, so they they had to do some some silly things, right? They also would try to do a little bit of uh, espionage. They would steal internal documents. They would try to get their hands on digital accounts of information, emails, meetings. Attendance lists. Attendance list. That's big. That's always going to be big. Uh, And then there's another example. There's a group called the Inkerman Group that gathers information about protesters and they have covertly deployed infiltrators on these demonstrations that are directed at certain businesses. Yeah. 
One of its confidential documents that was leaked again to The Guardian warned of the threat presented by protest groups that use direct action to disrupt the, quote, economic welfare of companies. Whoa. They're messing with the money. Don't don't mess with the money. Don't mess with the money. Somebody said that one time, messing with the money. I can't remember. That's true. Mm. But but this is this is strange because the we always get the question who is the they and stuff they don't want you to know. And it changes every episode. There are multiple they's in this situation. Yeah. Porsche, Royal Bank, those, those folks obviously don't want you to know that they spend part of their profits using these very, very, very unethical things, these pr- very unethical techniques rather, to infiltrate and stymie protest. And dissent in and, general. And dissent in general, right. And the – uh, the U.S. government, regardless of who, who is in office, is not going to stop doing this. Why would you stop doing this? This is a lot of bang for your buck. All you have to do is not get caught. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's, it's a saturation issue because if you've got one, even 10 agent provocateurs working in a big enough protest, like – you're probably not going to get caught if you're good at it. But here's the other big thing we know, Ben. Uh, the same tools that are used to actually organize demonstrations to get uh, – to have people give their opinion in public and share this kind of thing, these same things can be used against the organizers themselves and against the protest movement. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's it's strange because we – when we're talking about these new tools, we're talking about things like Twitter, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking about various digital social media. We're also talking about the enormous opportunities for organization that are posed by our smartphones. Yeah, our little tracking devices that we keep in our pockets. But the sword swings both ways, right? Yeah. And uh, the, this cannot be overemphasized. The conclusions for today's episode – are are tough. They're simple, but they're tough. What does this all mean? First, it means that you cannot trust everyone at a demonstration. So if you go to protest, as is your right in a lot of countries, and I believe it's a human I believe it should be a human right overall, uh, as you go, remember that no matter what you personally believe in, no matter why you personally are there or your friends, if you don't know someone, you are not sure why they are actually there. And there will be people in, in our audience today who have I – know, I know some of us have been to protest and I know you have seen something like this. So please write in if you have a personal experience that you're comfortable with sharing. And next, this means that we know this happens but we have no idea. There is not an official way to learn how many people are doing this. Is it an occasional – one-time thing? Is it a booming shadow industry? There's not a record to look at, so we can't make the call. Yeah. At what scale is the counterintelligence at work in whatever protest? Maybe it's zero percent. It is possible that there is zero percent counterintelligence happening. Or it could be even the, the, the counterintelligence could be the thing that started the protest. To, to try and uh, counteract a group that wasn't going to protest in the first place. There's no way to know. How many demonstrations like are just right now? There are demonstrators that are being poked and prodded by some kind of undercover agent. It's possible. We don't know. How many are happening right now? There's no way to know. Right. It's more greater than zero. Yes, yes, it's greater than zero. And that's a that's another crazy thing. It's safe to assume that protest over any controversial issue, again, regardless of how you feel about it, uh, will have a pretty high likelihood of being infiltrated, either in the planning process or especially if it's a large-scale protest, infiltrated the day of, right? Mm -hmm. And also, if we are being fair, there is a valid compelling reason for governments to monitor certain dissident groups supremacist, racial supremacist, separatist, domestic terrorist, and so on. There are dangerous people and there is a reason that these people should be monitored. The question is where does the line – where does the line exist, right? Where can, how can you legally say we better keep an eye on these vegans? 
Well, yeah, and it's generally a line, or it should be at least a line between violence and nonviolence, right? That's where the line should be. But when you when you add in this this catalyst, this agent provocateur thing, that's when it doesn't matter what the protest is about. It doesn't matter what the group is. It can become violent when you add that extra thing to it. So this is where today's episode ends, at least our part of today's episode, because we are looking forward to hearing from you and your fellow listeners are looking forward to hearing your stories as well. Let us know what your encounters with this sort of phenomenon have been. Uh, is it is it something – again, it's, it's a bit of a black box because there are no official records yet of how often or how – uh, infrequently this occurs. Let us know if you think it's alarmist. Let us know if you think there's more to the story. Let us know if you have any advice uh, for people who are also listening to the show who might be interested in organization or activism. Should they just not do it? Are there safe ways to do it? Because at the end of the day, we don't want anyone to die. Please. Absolutely. Well, and what do you think about protests in general? Do you think any oh, action yeah. truly occurs when a protest happens? Or do you think it's a way to pacify the people that's, by allowing protests? That's such a great question because that that's something people talked about, yeah. right? I, it worries me because it, it's that feeling. It's when you've got a big project coming up or a big uh, – a, a huge thing on the horizon in your life and you talk about it a lot but you mm -hmm. don't do much about it or you don't like make many plans or do anything about it. You have that same feeling of um, almost euphoria – in, in that the thing is actually happening just by talking about it, right? This is a phenomenon we've discussed before. Yes. And when a protest occurs on a wide enough scale, it makes you feel better perhaps that something's going to change or something's going to happen when in reality maybe status quo just remains and everybody goes home at the end of the night. Right. That's a, that's a very good point. These are, these are vital issues. Let us know. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Uh, we're Conspiracy Stuff on Facebook and Twitter. We're Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. I'm Ben Bullen at Instagram. And if you would like to learn some daily pizza facts, you can also follow me on Twitter. Oh, my God. I've been doing this for about a week now. It's uh, at Ben Bullen HSW. Okay. Where can people find you, Matt? Uh, you can't really find me anywhere. You can, you, you can locate me if you wish, but, uh, I, you're just, not going to make it easy. No, I'm trying to just hang out what off if, social media if possible. Yeah. What if someone can, uh, what if someone wants to call us? Okay. Well, you can call me right now because I'm going through the, the messages like today and this week I've been doing it. You can call 1-833-STDWYTK. Uh, just leave a message. Three minutes is the cap, but you can leave multiples if you wish, like some of our, uh, our some of you have. And I've been loving every single message that's coming in, and the, I'm sending it to the guys, and uh, we're very much enjoying it. So thank you. Keep sending them. Yeah, because we do listen to them. It means a lot, really. It really does. Thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, to bring some incredible stories to your fellow listeners. But hey, guys, you may say, what if I just, I mean, I think I think social media is like, I'm with Matt. That's a, that's a load of malarkey. But I'm also with Ben. I hate phones. I don't think I should have to talk <laughs> on them. Uh, well, don't worry, dear friend. We have good news for you. You can still communicate with us directly. You can send us an old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at HowStuffWorks.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.